initial proposal and for drafting it into the motion we will hear tonight. And also to councillors Matthew Nicholas and Abdul Basit Kadir for seconding the, the motion. Thank you all. Slavery shaped Liverpool, yet unlike other events in the city's history, it has not been remembered in the public realm. We are very proud of our past and rightly so. Historic markers can be found throughout the city. In Rumford Street, just to the back, there is a plaque, uh, during, uh, there's a, there is a plaque commemorating those who served on the Confederate ship, the CSS Shenandoah, during the American Civil War. This plaque was erected in 2015 with the blessing of the Council and commemorates those who fought to maintain slavery. At the same time, Americans were discussing the taking down of uh, Confederate monuments. Liverpool was erecting them. An organisation acknowledged on the plaque the Sons of the Confederate Veterans is listed by the Southern Poverty Law Centre as a racist, anti-Semitic, neo-Confederate group. Uh, the City Council also paid for the restoration of the grave of Irvin Bullard, a Confederate officer who fought on board the CSS Alabama and is buried in Topsfield Park Cemetery. So I say that to say this. Surely if it is right to commemorate those who fought to maintain slavery, it is more than fitting for the council to erect plaques to remember the victims of slavery that so enriched Liverpool with their toil. Every ward in this city has a historic connection to slavery within its boundaries, from street names, public parks, railway stations, schools, historic houses, and a host of other features of our fine city. Yet how many Liverpoolians know about these important connections to the town's involvement in the enslavement and death of millions of people? How many councillors know that the town hall was paid for by some of the most prominent slave traders of the 1740s? The portrait that adorned this building the pick merchants who were responsible for the enslavement of hundreds of thousands of men, women and children. Liverpool's greatest statesman, William Gladstone, four-time Prime Minister, whose statue stands proudly in St John's Gardens, was the son of Britain's most prominent plantation owner, and used his earliest speeches in the Commons to defend slavery. Yet the most precious legacy of slavery to Liverpool is our black community. Black people have been living here for centuries. The burial registers of St. Nicholas's Church, just down on the waterfront, record that on October 1st, 1717, more than 300 years ago, quote, Abel, a black Moor belonging to Mr. Rock, unquote, was, in, was interred in the graveyard. Liverpool's 18th century newspapers show that black people were bought and sold in the streets around this very building. These unfortunate individuals were just the first amongst many who over the centuries have contributed to the development of Liverpool's historic and resilient black community. Plaques highlighting some of the general forgotten facts will help inform people as to some of the reasons we're a multicultural city today. As many residents and visitors alike think that, the, that Liverpool first appeared on the world stage with the Grand National or the Beatles, when it was our dominance of the slave trade, not music or sports, that first brought the town to international attention and led to becoming the second city of empire and a magnet for people from all over the world. So I applaud the raising of the motion, but I must care my enthusiasm. We have literally been here before, you can see the name of down there. Uh, I remember standing in this very room 20 years ago, last month, uh, to witness the council's last act of the millennium, the passing of the motion expressing remorse for the role the city has played in the slave trade. Sadly, the actions contained in that motion are still to be implemented, as I'm sure men will uh, back me up on. Um, but hopefully the passing of tonight's motion and it being acted upon seriously and in close collaboration with the Liverpool Black History Research Group, who, 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 who actually promoted this idea in the first place, that will be a positive, will be a small step in adequately memorialising slavery in Liverpool's public ground. Thank you.
Secretary Mike Mass, Secretary Pass Hennessy from Unison, who was supposed to be addressing, but unfortunately due to the illness, you've got me instead. Pass has spent a considerable amount of her own time and money researching the life of Mary O'Shaughnessy, even as far as going to Brighton to the cemetery where Mary is buried. Pass has received a lot of support, not just from Unison, but from a lot of other councillors and other people uh, to help to make this project count for something. Not just a motion that is discussed and forgotten about, but a motion that takes on a life of its own and actually does mean something. One of Pat's main supporters has been Jeremy Wilson, who has supported Pat's, and I believe he'll make it possible for Pat's to address the Holocaust Memorial Service at the end of this month. Liverpool City Branch of Unison have agreed to work with interested parties with a view to setting up a Holocaust Memorial project. The aim of the project is to inform and educate current and future generations about the Holocaust and also about the threat posed by the far right even still today. The theme of the project is to remember the women and children of Red Ravensbrook. The inspiration for the project has been the remarkable story of Mary O'Shaughnessy. Mary was a non-Jewish disabled woman from Britain, a coal miner's daughter, who was the only woman from the north of England to have been held in Ravensbrook and survived. The survival was extraordinary. On arrival at the camp in May 1944, Mary was exempted from work duty because of her disability. This also meant that she was earmarked the gas chambers. Mary managed to evade the death selection squad a number of times, on at least one occasion by failing death, and on another occasion she was hit by fellow prisoners. The conditions at Ravensbrook, as we've all been made aware, were horrific. The women were wear to death, starved to death, or beaten to death. They were sleep deprived, malnourished, suffering from illness and disease, and horribly brutalised. The Nazis actually used Ravensbrook as a training base for the female guards who, having been trained up, would be then sent to guard the women's sections of the other ten death camps, those of the Auschwitz. Mary was liberated from Ravensbrook in April 45 by the Swedish Red Cross. She returned to Germany in 1946 to give evidence on the Ravensbrook war crimes to try to She was later made an honorary member of the RAF Escaping Society in recognition of her work and saved the lives of RAF aircrew by helping them to escape from occupied France. Despite their courage and terrible ordeal, Mary, women like Mary, are not known about today. Our project aims to remedy that and to honour the memory of all victims of the Holocaust. In this year, which marks the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Nazi death camps, Auschwitz, on the 27th of January, of Ravensbrück in April, the support of the Council for this project will be significant. Normally when you're speaking about a motion, you'd ask people to support this, but I really don't think I have to say something like that today. So thank you, Councillor, for giving up your time. And this is not me, this is Babs. Thank you. Will that still apply to the 300% charge or will 
that be subject to the officer's discretion. But there will be some situations where the long term vacancy is being resolved and rendered upon. It may not be made counterproductive to penalise the people taking on rather than the long term legacy problems. I understand this is about adopting the powers um, that are available to us under an act of parliament rather than the council's second policy itself. Other questions? <coughs> is that agreed? Okay, thank you. Moving on to item number six, no political announcements and updates. It's not about giving charity, it's about solidarity. 
It's about helping people, supporting people, and being there for people. Um, and that's what we need to do, and we will, uh, no doubt, need to do that more. And especially uh, after the general election results, uh, which was a devastating blow uh, to any uh, body that is not only working in local governments, but as a councillor in local governments, as we see uh, the likelihood of more austerity uh, coming down the tubes. There is a, a report coming out on Friday from the National Audit Office into uh, the Royal Liverpool Hospital and the collapse of Caribbean. That report has taken probably around 18 months to compile. I don't envisage that it will uh, in, you know, give us any um, comfort or, or any, um, if you like, good news. I think what it will highlight is what we already knew. And that was that the governments who put Carillion on their procurement framework uh, actually failed by allowing them not only to do the Royal Liverpool Hospital but to do other projects too. Which meant that with the privatisation of building control, there was no checks or balances on that building. Which has meant that Liverpool, instead of waiting three years for a new hospital, will probably wait between seven and eight years for a new hospital and it will be doubled in price uh, compared to what it was originally supposed to be uh, built for. And one of the things that I spoke to uh, the Chief Executive, uh, Steve Warburton, about today was to make sure that we lobby on their behalf, if it's necessary, to get more money into the existing Royal, to protect the services and to support the staff and the people that use the hospital. So we'll see a little bit more uh, in the reports on Friday. But for me, the blame squarely lies uh, with the government who allowed Carillion uh, to get hold of that hospital and, and build it. And the fact of the matter is, is that when you look at the hospital, um, I went to the open of one floor, uh, or to see one floor that was completely uh, fitted out to be used for patients. And then they found construction faults in the design of the building. That meant they had to decommission that whole ward. And that means that the building itself, without any structural support, or new support being put in it, could have actually been structurally unsafe in terms of the main standard. And then the insult, insulting thing on top of that was the fact that they put cladding that wasn't fit for purpose and meet the safety standards in a hospital where people are uh, terminally ill, where people are desperately in need of care after operations and they put cladding around the hospital that wasn't fit for purpose. So let's we'll look at uh, great interest at the Audit Office, uh, National Audit Office's report when it's produced uh, on Friday. But my, um, view is quite simple, that was this government's failure and a fault for allowing it uh, to happen. And just touching on uh, the general election results, already uh, we've seen uh, the uh, government's uh, support uh, and loving with the private sector where they're trying to halt uh, Liverpool's landlord licensing scheme, a scheme that has um, done more to protect so people against substandard housing uh, in this city uh, than any other time. Something uh, that has resulted in fines or prosecutions uh, for over 2,000 uh, landlords in the city that stop fatalities and injuries to people in our city and yet they are uh, trying to halt and stop that from happening. So we will be looking uh, seriously at how we can uh, legally review that decision and we are demanding uh, to receive an explanation as to why they've stopped it after over four years of successfully running it. And let's remember that the landlord licensing scheme is not a profit making scheme. Every single penny goes back in to paying for and supporting the staff that go out and visit their properties and they do a fantastic job. 
and we need to argue and fight as hard as we can to make sure that we uh, retain that. I just want to uh, finish on talking about the, the budget um, and people will see online, we went out on Friday uh, with our budget uh, proposals, it's out to consultation, it will last for a month, uh, the consultation is not closed, um, it is open for you as councillors, our cabinet members are going to be available for, for you, for opposition leaders, for anybody uh, to talk to them about the challenges that we face in each of those departments and what we intend doing to produce a balanced budget. But we've been able to reduce the gap, which was 57 million plus over 5 million, 5.5 five million in added pressures. We've been able to reduce that for a number of reasons, down to between 27 and 30 million pounds. We've been able to do that because of hard work. We've been able to, to do that because of the things that we've been doing. Uh, and we've set out in the budget the presentation uh, that we've made uh, to you, and it's online, uh, an explanation of how we're going to be making uh, some of those savings. But we know compulsory redundancies are services, are libraries, our legislation, centres, our children's centres will all remain open, every single one of them. There's £10 million going in to pay people who are contracted to do work in social care on our behalf. There's £10 million going in so they can be paid the living wage. That's something that we should be proud of as a Labour Council as we are at there are many things in there, 60 new social workers, more apprenticeships that are going to be working with LSSL and with others and to protect uh, the services that we provide for the people of this city. We're fortunate because we got a couple of things. On the 22nd of uh, December we got told that we received uh, £10 million from the Better Care Fund. We weren't, as I say, aware of that until uh, around about 4 o'clock on the 22nd of, of December, which is for one year. But that's meant that we have got additional funding that can reduce that gap uh, of funding in adult social care. We've also got a windfall of £15 million from the Merseyside Pension Fund. Again, because of the money that we've been putting in and because of the performance of the Pension Fund that's given us £15 million. There's also because of um, the transformation that you see of Ed's Lane um, and the development of Ed's Lane together with Mersey Retail Park up in Speed, the Speed Retail Park, the number of developments and businesses that have uh, been set up over the last 18 months to 20 months have now transitioned into payments of business rates for the next financial year. That equates that amounts to about £10 million. The uh, number of houses, 12,000 uh, houses uh, over the last eight, nine years, but in the last couple of years, the new houses that have been built have meant that the budget for April uh, this year means that there will be about £3.7 million of new council tax that comes into the budget. The council tax increase, 3.9%, uh, percent, means that 2% of that is ring fenced for that on social care. But it's an extra £7.2 million pound that goes into the budget that enables us uh, actually to support services. We're putting up um, car parking charges around about 25%. It will still keep us uh, lower than um, some of the car parks in the city, Q Park and others. There are some of the things that were really unpalatable that we've taken out. That we've got to uh, protect vulnerable people, young people. Uh, in terms of transport support for them getting to and from school. So we're protecting that. That was £7.4 uh, million. Pounds. We're also looking at we're one of the only cities in the country that protects uh, and helps keep the recycling of the green bins without charge. We're also doing that, but 50% of councils across the country don't 
because we know that it's speak or not speak. You struggle to make ends meet, and you have a garden. You can't afford to pay a, a, a surcharge on those. So there are many things within there um, that you can uh, see. And as I said, this isn't a closed process. It is a proposal that we are putting forward to people that closes that budget gap and enables us, as I said, to protect frontline services uh, and, all, and keep jobs and services going uh, in this city. So I, uh, in March, uh, will be moving a budget, something similar to what you see today. But it's your opportunity over the next four weeks to engage, to make comments, uh, along with our trade union colleagues, uh, it was good to see here the leaders uh, of the other groups that are here and it's up to you to put forward any suggestions or any uh, proposals uh, moving forward. That's really uh, just a contribution and update uh, Lord Mayor on where we are. But I think from when I met and talked to um, just before Christmas and we had councillors in to look at a debate and a discussion around the challenges that each department had to make. I think you'll agree with me that the progress that we've made and the things that we've been able to do has been really a great step forward in protecting services. Thank you.